welcome to the Crossing Borders podcast. I'm your host, Julie White. On this show, my guests and I share information to help foreign trained health providers find their way into meaningful careers in the Canadian healthcare system. Let's get started. Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting edition of Crossing Borders. I have an incredible guest with me today. I am so excited. I have Gobi Ten Narhintaram, and he is one of, well, he's the only one that I'm aware of right now who is a physician assistant right now. Um, So he is an internationally educated general physician. He's got his MD from Ukraine um, and is now working as a clinical physician assistant in the GTA. Um, He's a graduate of the healthcare administration program from St. Lawrence College from December 2022 as well. So welcome, Gobi Tan. Thank you so much, Julie, for a great introduction. And it's always really fun having you. And uh, from start to beginning, you have been an utmost support for me. And thanks again. (laughs) Oh, no problem. We're so thrilled to have you um, on this show. And I know you have come back and spoken with um, some of the students who are in the healthcare administration program. Um, you know, working as a, you know, a, a clinician and, and, you know, trying to find their way. And it's a really tough nut to crack out there. So we're hopefully going to get some good tips from you in terms of what some of the options are um, that people may have and, and kind of about your journey as well. Yeah, true. So let's see, I could do whatever I can. And hopefully I am always open to anyone who needs help. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to start with a bit of a rapid fire um, question and answer period just to get you warmed up and to let our audience in to see a little bit about what makes you tick. Are you ready for this? (laughs) Okay. And yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. What do you prefer, roller coasters or horseback rides? Um, Roller coaster. (laughs) LinkedIn, Instagram, WhatsApp or Snapchat? Uh, obviously Instagram, uh, <laughs> because uh, any social media platform uh, I prefer among uh, is the Instagram because it allows me to share moments of my life through photos and videos in a visually appealing way. So I always try to post uh, things on a regular basis, connecting with friends, family, and even strangers. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll have to look for you on Instagram. Um, <laughs> Apple TV, Disney Plus, Netflix, or YouTube? Uh, Netflix. (laughs) Anything you're particularly watching right now? Uh, Right now, no. I haven't had uh, some time for for myself. (laughs) (laughs) We did did say that you were a physician assistant, didn't we? (laughs) (laughs) All right. uh, Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster? Mm, Bigfoot. Books or videos? Uh, obviously books um, because uh, there's something magical about the smell of books and the feel of turning the pages i love get, getting lost in a good book uh, yeah we've got an old soul with us <laughs> <laughs> um dogs or cats uh, how about dogs and cats uh, because I can't choose between dogs and cats. Uh, I love them both for different reasons. Um, dogs are very loyal, affectionate, and companions who bring joy and uh, laughter. Uh, on the other hand, uh, cats are very independent, mysterious creatures uh, who fascinate me with their unique personalities and works. Yeah, each has its own charm, yeah. Okay, that's a good answer. Good answer. Um, Tim Hortons or Starbucks? Uh, Tim Hortons. <laughs> Special place because uh, we all know that it's an original Canadian brand. And it's more just than a coffee. It's a part of our daily routines and a cultural icon now. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, are you an early bird or a night owl? Uh Night out. <laughs> okay. I have, yeah, I have always been more productive uh, and creative during the late hours of the time. Yeah, is that because that's when it's quiet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoy the peace and quiet that comes with the night time, and I find that my mind is uh, 
often most active and inspired when the world uh, around me is sleeping. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So let's move into getting to know a little bit uh, more about you. So can you walk us through a little bit about your early story? So how did you kind of come to be who you are and um, wind up getting your doctor of medicine from um, the Odessa National Medical University in Ukraine? Uh, Okay, so... My journey to obtaining uh, my Doctor of Medicine from Odessa National Medical University in Ukraine is um, deeply rooted in the circumstances and challenges I faced growing up in the northern part of Sri Lanka. <clears throat> As you all know, in 2009, uh, amidst the backdrop of a, a tumultuous period marked by conflicts, completing higher education posed uh, unique uh, challenges for me. Uh, the safety concerns coupled with limited educational opportunities in my hometown led my parents to consider options uh, abroad for my undergraduate studies. So it was uh, uh, 16 uh, at the tender age uh, without the benefit of uh, comprehensive career guidance. I found myself uh, embarking on a journey to a foreign land. Um, the decision to pursue medicine was not a predetermined one, <clears throat> but uh, it was a path I stumbled upon, influenced uh, by the choices of those who came uh, before me, maybe my seniors who did my, uh, who I did my studies in my school. Uh, so in those early days, I lacked the clarity of uh, purpose and direction that often accompanies more mature decisions in your 20s but as i was 16 i didn't have that much of a clear guidance so however surviving medical school in ukraine was a testament to my resilience and adaptability i was an average student to be frank and i did face academic challenges but i made it each time Uh, you were 16 when you started out and were you on your own then at 16 yeah okay And when you went, I'm assuming to the Ukraine, kind of at 16, um, what languages did you speak and what was spoken there? Uh, Basically, there are two languages, uh, Russian and Ukrainian. But most people in Ukrainian uh, knew Russian and uh, there's no major differences between Russian and Ukrainian. A slight difference. Uh, But we all been... uh, uh, teached in English language. So we did have a one year of uh, Ukrainian studies, but that's only for the one year at the beginning. So you learned a new language as well as adapting to a new culture and you're 16 years old. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Okay. Sorry, continue on with your story. Uh, So as you said, uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine provided a conductive environment for my growth and learning. Uh, the experience uh, broadened my horizons, exposed me to diverse perspectives, and instilled in me a deep appreciation for the field of medicine. So as you, you in uh, conclusion, like uh, reflecting on my journey now, I recognize that my path to becoming a physician was not conventional, nor was it guided by a lifelong aspiration. However, it is a journey marked by uh, resilience, determination, and a commitment. But if you asked me that if I would uh, change careers, if I was uh, 20s or if I right now, obviously no, because um, now I understood why uh, it, uh, why c- certain circumstances took me that way. And uh, now I can't think of any f- other career beyond uh, medicine and uh, uh yeah i would i would always choose medicine all right and do you come from a family with anybody with a medicine background at all and no i am the first uh, doctor from my family <laughs> all right generation. and are you are you kind of the first from your family to come over to canada as well and no i have my elder brother here okay so he came here when he was 10 year old 10 year old so he had uh, family support here then so and uh, for me, it's my brother who gave me further guidance on coming to Ontario. 
Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Um, are you in the same area now? Yeah, we both okay. live uh, together. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. So it took a it took a few years, but now you're together. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, did you practice then as a as a family physician before coming to Ontario? Um, no. So basically, how it works is like after my graduation in 2016, I moved to Sri Lanka. So even if you have done uh, uh, medicine undergraduate studies and have a degree, you need to have uh, a, an examination conducted and proof that you are eligible to uh, serve people in your hometown as well. So I did my exams in Sri Lanka. So I did uh, pass all my exams and uh, during that period only I had to choose uh, other postgraduate studies. Then I started applying to certain colleges and uh, universities. Then I got uh, selected in St. Lawrence College and that's how it uh, further moved. But uh, during the period of 2022, I had, I was called for registration of provincial registration to start working in Sri Lanka. And I also got my visa at that time. So I had to choose between uh, remaining in Sri Lanka and continuing to work there or else to move abroad. Uh, so I chose here and now I am here. <laughs> so you're licensed in Sri Lanka to practice right now? Yeah. Okay. And you're obviously somebody who understands how to kind of approach that licensure and figure out what's needed here and there. Um, and kind of all of the filling, filling out all of the the paperwork, I think probably (laughs) is the worst part, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What is it with physicians and paperwork? (laughs) All right. Um, so you came to Ontario, um and you were here at the time of the pandemic weren't you you arrived kind of in the the first year of the pandemic um i came here on 2021 october yeah okay. yeah all right so it was coming we're coming out of it then yeah <laughs> all right um and in terms of um what your doing now in Canada and and kind of why you chose to stay in Ontario. Um, Can you talk a little bit more now about what you're doing and how you're working as a physician assistant? Uh, So uh, as earlier said, uh, with the support of uh, my elder brother, um, so I turned my attention to Ontario as a potential destination. Um, So Mm, so the decision to pursue, as you, as earlier said, to uh, healthcare administration, uh, because uh, it leveraged my background in medicine, and uh, uh, so it also can contribute to healthcare management and those things. So I thought, uh, and recognizing the importance of uh, effective healthcare career. Uh, and improving patient outcomes, then I started uh, searching for jobs uh, within the healthcare and uh, navigating the process during my studies, like uh, researching colleges and uh, applying for certain programs. So that gave me ideas on what I can really rely on when I'm in Ontario. So it's the basic research that I did before coming to um, Ontario. And... um, Okay. So regarding the question, how I did uh, get uh, the uh, current job as a clinical assistant is through networking and uh, volunteering. Okay. So yeah, uh, it's basically two main factors for me, like uh, building professional connections within the healthcare community is essential for finding opportunities and uh, gaining insights in Canada. So it's always uh, I had some friends who uh, who are also doctors here in Canada. So I find them, I talk to them, and I did volunteering jobs for some days, and they liked my work, and that's how it all began. Okay, so when you were in the healthcare admin program, I know um, 
there's there's often you know a, a bit of unrest in terms of okay so what do i do after this um is is seeking your licensure one of those things that you have in mind right now um and did you have that in mind while you were in the program uh no obviously i had a, it's my long term run uh plan and uh, i always wanted to pursue a career um as a physician so uh, in a long run what i thought is i need to have some canadian experience uh starting from um, i did my so well, i wanted to uh, put in some um how i began to start working uh, in canada in ontario as a student i engaged in a variety of part time work and volunteering opportunities to gain uh, valuable experience and uh, contribute to my personal and professional growth so one of my first jobs in canada was working in gas station <laughs> so as a customer service representative so this role provided me with uh, valuable experience in customer service communication and uh, multitasking uh interacting interacting with uh, customers from diverse backgrounds helped me develop strong interpersonal skills and, uh, and yeah adaptability yeah. that was my first job too by the way <laughs> oh, <it's laughs> aside from working on the farm back home okay. working in a gas station you get mm-hmm. everything right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right what other what other part time jobs did you do here or did you just have the one Uh, no additionally i had the opportunity to work as a personal support worker at uh, north york general hospital uh, this role allowed me to directly support patients in need and contribute to their uh, well being so working as a psw not only provided uh, me with hands on uh, experience in healthcare but also like reinforced my passion for helping others and Uh, my decision to pursue career in a healthcare field yeah great and was it difficult to get a role as a psw i know um things things are changing constantly right now but initially i think it was more difficult for physicians to get a role as a psw than it would be a nurse um but you didn't have any problems with that uh yeah i did apply for many jobs PS, as a psw but most of the psw organization they consider they prefer a female uh, nurse practitioner or any female uh, healthcare professionals uh, but coming from a uh, background healthcare background where they also had i also had to undergo uh, steps of interviews and uh, yeah it was really difficult uh, but now things have changed yeah yeah and and how was it kind of personally um you know you're a physician and you're working as a PSW and I don't want to discredit that profession at all um because that is an incredibly um selfless um really important role for folks to be be doing um but how did it feel being a physician in that role i'm sensing you had a lot of gratitude um just for being able to get the experience uh yeah obviously you are right uh so being a psw needs more of uh, you have to be emotionally connect to each uh, residents and uh, uh, it's very hard especially when you work uh, to elderly patients and uh, people with dementia and in the alzheimer's stage so it's need more of an understanding i think it's um, Uh, with one year of studies or with uh, six months of uh, studies you can't just get those emotional connect so it needs more of a um, uh, practical training and uh, more of in depth knowledge to understand understand each of the patients personally yeah. yeah so these are things that you're going to take with you um you know through life and through the the care that you're providing to people um and you mentioned that your current role um as a physician assistant was one that you were able to 
um, land by networking and just kind of being out there. Can you talk a little bit more about that process and what you do um, and what the requirements really are to to fill that role? Uh, so uh, basically, you do everything uh, how a doctor does back in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, so you have to, uh, I have to assist my boss. Uh, who is a family physician. So basically starting from uh, greeting a patient, just uh, taking a history, full history, and then near doing a, any necessary examination that is oriented uh, to the specific patient and their concerns. And uh, here it's more of uh, electronic medical records and uh, we work uh, with papers back in home. So... That was really a challenge here, but we learned uh, uh, during our healthcare administration courses as well how to um, work in a computer-based uh, environments. And so, uh, and then uh, I was able to meet many patients. Like I had to see around hundred to hundred and twenty patients a day. So it's like more of how. Uh, you could see how uh, difficult handling uh, primary health care is uh, for uh, such doctors. So it is really easy for the ones who handle uh, such institution when, uh, so when they um, take uh, opportunities to use as, us as, uh, as the, um, uh, one of the staffs. So making it uh, smooth the practices. Okay. Yeah. So you're doing a lot of the, you're kind of doing the, the front end, um, greeting the patients, talking to them about symptoms and things, and then doing a lot of the the data entry type of work yes. um, to and, assist the physician. And also, uh, as you earlier said, it's all always deeper work. <laughs> paperwork. Yes, it's always the paperwork. And everywhere you have a referral for has some form of different form, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of that transition, so you're going into the job, you've got, you know, what it's like to be a physician in Sri Lanka, um, what you've been trained, you know, to do um, in the Ukraine, and then you come to Canada, and is the system a lot different than than what you were expecting? Uh, obviously, yes. So, uh, <laughs> um, what uh, what to begin with? So, basically, I thought uh, Canada is much better in terms of healthcare, and uh, they have a lot of uh, good um, uh, infrastructure, and they have their own. Um, way of handling the patients but when you work inside you know there is a lot of loopholes and uh, how they can uh, do better in uh, primary healthcare settings so they need to work more on primary healthcare settings of what i believe mm -hmm. and you're clearly you know you probably see the shortage of primary care physicians firsthand okay. Uh, working in primary care here in Ontario has been an like uh, eye-opening experience for me, especially given the challenges like uh, posed by the shortage of primary care providers. One of the biggest lessons I have learned is the critical role uh, those uh, care plays in the healthcare system as a whole. Uh, it's often the first point of contact for patients like when preventive care, like early in intervention and uh, continuity of care. However, the shortage of uh, primary care providers has made it increasingly difficult to meet the growing demand for the essential services. So when I first came to Canada, I had an understanding of the importance of primary care, but I didn't fully appreciate the extent of shortage and its implications for patients and providers. I imagined uh, a system where every patient could easily access quality uh, primary care services when needed. Uh, however, uh, as a student, I also find it difficult to first access the primary care. Um, the reality is that many patients face uh, long wait times to see a primary care provider 
leading to delays in uh, diagnosis and treatment and uh, ultimately impacting the patient uh, outcomes yeah so when you have that incredible awareness and and probably if you went on to the registry it's healthcare connect i believe um to say that you uh would like to sign up to get a, a physician a family physician and the wait time is I don't know, seven years, I think, mm -hmm. um, you probably wouldn't have one yet yourself. Um, and the students that you went through school with probably don't have them yet. And you think about all of the newcomers that, that um, have arrived in the last five years, and, and it's pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then for you, as somebody who is passionate about providing that you know, that family medicine, do you kind of look at your future career and think, do I really want to get into this? Or do you look at it and say, let me at it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think uh, seeing those uh, burden uh, in healthcare settings, I, I see many primary care health practitioners and the family physicians uh, changing careers or they are like, um, more looking for another um, specialties but I would say I wanted to be a family physician even though those burdens I find a lot of reward uh, doing this job yeah okay all right and um, do you need to have any special training to work um, as a physician assistant is there yes. a training that you need to take? Okay, what is that? So currently I am uh, being addressed as a clinical physician assistant. So for physician assistant, you need to uh, um, undergo two years of studies in Canada to be a physician and PA in Canada. So it only have, we have uh, four colleges that does here. One is the UFT and a uh, few other universities that I don't currently remember. Okay. Uh, yeah, only four universities have has been giving those, uh, but it's very competitive. It's uh, for profession, uh, clinical physician assistant, it's more of uh, uh, your background and those things and your current, uh, what did you do in Ontario or the health, health care administration really helped me. <laughs> okay so it's it's the it's the adding the clinical physician assistant yeah in front of it okay i got you now <laughs> um so and and that obviously is something that um you're able to use and you're obviously getting some great experience as well yeah true <laughs> okay um and in terms of your timeline are there things that you're thinking about um, in terms of, you know, when you might want to throw your hat in the ring for, um, a, a, a CARMS match, or do you have that kind of in your mind right now? Uh, yes, I do. Um, for the, for current plan is my, currently I am in my postgraduate, uh, work permit. So until 2026. So I am on my, uh, like, uh, I wanted to apply for PR now. Uh, by next month and uh, once uh, I started applying um, so I have plans for the next few years uh, my primary goal is to uh, continue advancing my career in the healthcare field in Canada um, as uh, as I am currently in the process of obtaining permanent uh, residency and have plans to pursue Canadian medical council exam soon my immediate focus will be comp uh, will be on successfully completing these milestones. Uh, in the short term, I aim to uh, dedicate myself to preparing for and passing the Canadian Medical Council exams, uh, which will enable me to practice uh, medicine in Canada. This will involve, uh, I know, this will uh, really involve more of a rigorous study preparation and possibly additional training to uh, ensure that I am well equipped uh, to meet the standards and requirements of the Canada, Canadian healthcare. Uh, in addition uh, to pursuing clinical practice, I am also interested in um, exploring opportunities from professional development and uh, also adv advancement. Uh, this may 
um, involved, for example, participating in continuing uh, education activities, uh, pursuing additional certifications or specialized training, and actively engaging in professional networks, which I am currently doing. And uh, yeah, so ultimately, my overarching goal for next five years is to uh, um, establish myself as a respected and valued healthcare professional, be it in Canada or my home country, uh, contributing uh, to the well-being of my patients and communities where I am working. Beautiful. Um, when you talk about some of those additional certifications too, um, are you are you talking about kind of things like project management or Lean Six Sigma, or are you looking more at clinical um, things like wound management, um, or, or is there is there a mixture of things that you're thinking about? Yeah, you are right, uh, Julie. So a uh, few of the courses that I really did uh, first coming uh, soon uh, to Canada is uh, I did uh, training in basics uh, life support and uh, advanced life support. It is very mandatory. And I also did uh, courses that is more towards the elderly care. So you could find a lot of courses in LinkedIn, um, Google uh, certifications. And uh, so more of a dementia and Alzheimer's, those related care and those things. So I did certifications. And other thing is the patient safety and quality improvement certifications. Uh, yeah. Uh, like uh, training in patient safety and quality improvement uh, equips healthcare professionals with the knowledge and skills to identify, analyze, and uh, to mitigate risk right so it mm -hmm. will be really helpful for any healthcare professional and also one of the other thing is the clinical research certification uh, for healthcare professionals uh, who are interned uh, interested in research and evidence-based practice training in clinical practice uh, research measure methods could be very helpful so certifications Mm, such as we could you could found, uh, find is uh, the clinical research coordinator certificate or the clinical research associate certificate those things will really be help helpful fantastic um are you familiar with a lot of the resources that are available on the national newcomer navigation network website as well uh, maybe it may be a new one for you yeah. um and if you go to it's it's n4 um it's a um organization that is funded by ircc and it's hosted through the children's hospital of eastern ontario so that's just kind of where the folks that that work there are based out of so they there's a there's a payment basically um operation that's that kind of runs behind the scenes but they're very much focused on healthcare and integration um and they've mapped out some of the pathways so for physicians um and there's a couple of different pathways depending on what it is you want to do they've got pathways for for nurses as well so they've got some fantastic resources as well um but there's yeah there's there are growing groups now and it's pretty exciting to hear that you know we've got new medical school programs at at York University for example that are coming um really focused on primary care um and family medicine and and those really are those you know critical pieces in the healthcare system so um i don't know if you've got any any comments that you want to add to some of the political things related to <laughs> primary care <laughs> Uh, He's going to wisely plead the fifth. <laughs> but we don't have the fifth in Canada. <laughs> so I did uh, attend a few workshops, but I'm not aware whether they talk this similar thing that you are currently um, pinpointing. But I will have a look on it. And uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, and I know we're we're getting close to our time, but. Um, I just want to see if you have any special advice um, or tips or tricks for any of the new grads who are in school right now. 
Mm-hmm. So anybody who's taking that healthcare administration or a healthcare management um, that has maybe a, a, a family medicine background, what kinds of tips do you have for them? Uh, <laughs> so I would say stay adaptable and resilient. Uh, one thing. So here the job market and um, the industries are constantly evolving, as you said, prefer like earlier. So it is important to be adaptable and also resilient in the face of change. So embrace uh, challenges uh, as opportunities for growth remain open to new possibilities. Uh, and also the other thing is set goals and take action at the right time. So take enough time to clarify your goals and aspirations, like for short term and then for the long term. So break them uh, down into manageable steps, uh, like few baby steps, and create a plan of action to achieve uh, them. And also, other thing is the to seek mentorship and guidance. Uh, so don't be afraid to reach out to mentors, especially like uh, Julie, uh, advisors and uh, professionals in your field for guidance and uh, also advice. They can offer valuable insights, share their experiences and provide support uh, as you navigate. And the uh, the main thing that I wanted to highlight is the uh, prioritizing uh, self-care. Balancing academic demands and uh, work commitments and personal responsibilities can be very challenging. So make uh, self-care a priority by taking time for rest relaxation, travel somewhere, exercise. So activities that bring you joy and fulfillment. Yeah. So taking care of your physical and mental well-being is essential for success and happiness. Beautifully said. And I hope you are able to do that in between (laughs) everything that you're managing. It's so important. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's not the do as i say <laughs> yeah it's, not it's do as you do right you gotta yeah. do it yeah yeah so, all right yeah. what's one thing that you wish somebody would have told you before you arrived in canada uh so uh, one thing i think the preparedness so they would have uh, uh, earlier told me about the ongoing uh, issues that is happening in uh, the Ontario or even in Canada. Um, so including uh, the housing prices and those things. As a when you even though you are a student now or you are a single, but after, in the long run you you're gonna be a family and you need to have a home and those shelter thing is very important so uh, when i think of these housing prices i it really makes me crazy and i think i have even thought of moving back to my home country but it's not the only thing that is uh, in canada we need to rely on there are many good things that we can look around in canada and I am really happy about my decisions that I made. And uh, yeah. All right. This is good. Um, and, and really, you know, when you're talking about the housing crisis and, and, you know, housing is a big part of those social determinants of health, right? So yeah. these are these are all very valid issues that affect the health of the population as well. So I'm sure, you know, we're hearing more about social prescribing. You're probably going to be somebody who's using those words, or if you're not doing it now, you will be. Um, so that's fantastic. How do you stay motivated? Mm. <laughs> so I... I surround uh, myself with uh, people who always support me uh, uh, like family friends mentors uh, who believe in me and uh, encourage me to pursue my goals uh, their encouragement guidance and feedback provide me with the motivation and i also try to be uh, like be in a inspired mood I seek out uh, sources of inspiration, whether it's through 
uh, reading books, uh, listening to post podcast, attending seminars or connecting with uh, individuals who have already achieved in my field. Uh, so exposing myself to new ideas like perspectives and uh, how I could uh, improve better uh, in my career is my uh, long-term goal right so i always focus on how to be a better man uh, person to imp- reach my goals and wow. also as said earlier i do practice self-care excellent <laughs> i am so glad to hear that <laughs> <laughs> all right um is there anything else that we haven't covered that you want to add to this conversation mm, i think i have covered a, everything and uh, and I also see that uh, many new graduates, they wanted guidance. And um, I am always open to anyone who needs help from me and who needs career guidance or anything uh, that can be helpful, any insights or how to uh, proceed further with their career and how they can overcome those fears. So I am uh, always open and they can connect to me through LinkedIn and uh, Instagram as well. (laughs) Of course, you got to You got to have Instagram in there (laughs) and those connections will be fun. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Gobitan, for, for joining me today and for sharing a really incredible story of of your journey. Um, And when you look back, it's probably not that long since you were 16 years old, Um, But boy, oh boy, you've covered an awful lot of ground and and learned a lot. And um, I hope that your next number of years are going to be just as successful. Um, Because, you know, we need more people like you working in primary care. Um, And hopefully you can solve that that paperwork problem, too. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for joining me. And I uh, wish you the best of luck and congratulations. A little bit early. Hopefully you'll get that PR real quick to help you kind of get on to that next step. Thank you so much. uh, Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope the information shared today helps you in your journey. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Crossing Borders on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're so inclined, rate this show or provide feedback in the comments. You can always find more information at profjulie.ca.